I just built this star tracker for about $30. It's a very simple mechanism. Instead of using a motorized gear to track the stars, like in a commercial star tracker, this tracker makes me the motor, and I manually track the sky by turning this threaded bolt, and this counteracts the Earth's rotation. Stick around and I'll explain how it works, show you how to build one, and then we will do a real world test of it by shooting several two minute exposures of the Milky Way and the Ro Ufuki cloud complex, which is beautiful, with a basic DSLR and a 24 millimeter lens. Hello there, my name is Nico Carver and my YouTube channel, Nebula Photos, is all about helping people learn astrophotography. I'm especially interested in how to approach astrophotography on a budget. Of course, many aspects of astrophotography become easier if you just throw money at them. Um, and it's easy to go down a gear buying rabbit hole. I've been guilty of it myself, but I also enjoy getting the most out of budget gear and budget techniques, um, which is what I'm gonna be showing you tonight with this. I do have a Patreon to support this channel, and if you join the Patreon, you can also join my Discord server, which is a great place to ask questions and talk to others in the Nebula Photos community, including me. I'm going to say up front here, I'm not super skilled in DIY stuff, but when I read about this uh, star tracker, that's basically just two boards connected by a hinge with a ball head on top and then a threaded bolt that you turn uh, to track, I thought, well, this sounds simple enough that even I should be able to make one. Um, and and it, I did, and it works. And the inventor of this style of tracker is George Haig, who released the idea for free and described how to make it in this April 1975 issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. It's called, uh, sometimes called a Scotch mount because George Haig is Scottish. And probably the most common name for it though is a barn door tracker. And it's been a popular DIY project for amateur astronomers um, ever since he published this in 1975. And there've been many different versions of the design, improvements to it maybe. But I'm gonna make the original Hague design, um, both to keep the costs low and because I'm fascinated by the simplicity of it. Before we jump into making one, let me just very quickly explain how this kind of tracker works. And it's pretty easy in terms of the math, so this isn't gonna take too long. Uh, the reason the stars move from our vantage point is of course because the Earth is rotating around its axis. And the Earth moves 360 degrees, or one full rotation, every 24 hours. For the astrophotographer, what this means is that if you just point your camera at the, at the night sky and leave the shutter open for a long time, the stars will trail, meaning turn from little points to arced lines that we call star trails. This, of course, also blurs out any deep sky object like a nebula or galaxy. And one way to get around this, which I've described in several other videos now, is just to take very short exposures and then stacking many hundreds or thousands of these short exposures together with stacking software. The name for this that's sort of catching on is untracked astrophotography. And untracked astro works well, but it just has some definite limitations. Um, the main one being that you have to take hundreds and hundreds of photos, and so that can wear out your mechanical uh, shutter in the DSLR. And then it also just takes a long time to uh, you know, transfer all the files and stack them all together on your computer. And another limitation is that it works really well for bright deep sky objects like Orion and Andromeda, but not so well for dim ones. So to solve this, we usually turn to star trackers, which um, just move at a constant rate that's opposite the, the Earth's rotation in the opposite direction. And that lets us take much longer exposures with the camera with pinpoint stars. So as I said earlier, Earth is rotating 360 degrees every 24 hours. We can divide that down to 15 degrees per hour or 0.25 degrees per minute. So if we look at these two boards, what we really need to do is move one away from the other at a rate of 0.25 degrees per minute, and that will keep up with the stars. Now, a very common piece of hardware that you can buy is a quarter inch 20 bolt, meaning it's quarter inch in diameter, and it has a thread spacing of 20 threads per inch. And so that's what we're gonna use to drive our mount. We're gonna, because we can drive that at one revolution per minute, it'll travel one inch 
every 20 minutes or 0 0.05 um, inches per one minute. So we know now, okay, we have to move 0 0.05 inches per minute and we want the boards to move apart from each other at 0.25 degrees. Um, so all we need now is to solve this equation. And if you remember some trigonometry, uh, you might already know what's coming here. Uh, what we do is we use a simple formula and what we need is uh, the hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse is gonna equal the opposite side of the angle. So we know that's 0 0.05. We know the angle is 0 0.25. So what we can do is divide by sine times the angle. So 0 0.05 divided by sine times 0 0.25 and we get 11.4 inches or 290 millimeters for those metric folks. And so we want the hole for the bolt to be 290 millimeters away from the hinge. And then if we uh, track at one rotation per minute, we're gonna get perfect stars. And yes, for this to work, we also need to be polar aligned. And so that's the hard part, keeping this build uh, on the cheap. And so what I did is I'm just using a metal drinking straw um, on here, taped right by the hinge to cite Polaris. But really this is the first thing that I wanna improve in my next revision of this mount as the straw to cite Polaris is really a bit of a pain to use. It's not that accurate um, and it won't work for the Southern hemisphere. So. I'm on the lookout for a, for a used finder scope. I mean, a used polar scope would be even better, but something, a laser, I don't know. But um, let me know in the comments if you have any kinds of ideas for an accurate way to polar align this kind of mount, a DIY mount, as cheaply as possible. Okay, anyways, now that we know how it works, let's go through the steps of building it. And, uh, I made a PDF guide you can download from the link in the description for building it. I'm gonna go through the steps fairly quickly so the guide will be a helpful uh, reference if you, if you wanna look at that while you're building one yourself. Step one, measure and cut two pieces of one by six lumber to 12 and 11 16 inches long. That's 322 millimeters for the metric folks. If you don't have a saw, um, Home Depot or other kind of home improvement hardware stores might uh, cut the lumber for you in the store. Step two, put your hinge or hinges if you're using two um, along the edges of the boards to mark out where the holes are gonna go and then drill some small holes to attach the hinges. And then you're gonna screw on the hinge with some small wood screws. Um, I'll just note here, I was able to find a six inch long hinge and I'll put a link in the description of of one online that I found. If you can't find that though, two uh, smaller hinges, like two three inch hinges would work just as well. Um, it should now look like this with uh, two boards connected by the hinge. Step three, now you wanna measure out a spot on the bottom board, exactly 11.42 inches or 290 millimeters from the hinge and uh, make it centered uh, in terms of top to bottom on the board. Um, and mark this and then drill a quarter inch hole there. You're then gonna glue and hammer in a quarter inch T-nut into the top of the bottom board. And uh, when you glue it or epoxy it, be careful not to get any of the glue into the threads of the T-nut. It's just to secure the T-nut uh, to the board a little bit better um, than you could by just hammering it. Step four, repeat step three, except this time put the T-nut in the exact middle of your bottom board so that that would be six and five sixteenths of an inch or 161 millimeters. This is where you will attach the tracker to your tripod. Step five, um, I've lost the sunlight so I'm indoors now. This is how your tracker should look and you can go ahead and screw in the long quarter inch 20 carriage bolt with the round head into the T-nut that is 290 millimeters away from the hinge. This is gonna be your drive bolt for the tracker and you can test it out if you want. Step six, print out the pattern I'm providing to make your clock wheel. You can just uh, print it out on regular printer paper and glue it onto a CD. But if you happen to have Avery CD labels like I did laying around, you can use those, makes it even easier. 
Step seven, we're now going to secure the clock wheel and a handle, um, which is, I'm just using a sort of a little metal brace here I found, to the bottom of the drive bolt. And I'd recommend using some nuts, washers, and epoxy, um, and then tighten it all up with some pliers so that it's all secured very well to the bottom of the bolt and very permanent. And once you have all that done, you should be able to easily turn the bolt up and down with the handle like this, and the clock wheel will rotate around. Now go ahead and decide where to attach your ball head to the top board and drill a hole so you can attach it with a shorter quarter inch 20 bolt. I put my ball head in the center uh, lengthwise, but towards the top widthwise. Um, I'm putting it towards the top of what will be the north end of the board because I'm going to be mostly using my tracker for Milky Way, which will always be to the south here. So I was thinking for balance with lenses that the weight would be more distributed equally this way if the lens is coming out uh, towards the south. I'm not sure if this really makes any difference, but that was the, the thought behind it. Step nine, measure the center point of your boards. Um, at the, at the end of it, uh, where the clock wheel is, and drill out two little holes for the screw eyes. And you can just screw those in by hand. Um, and then you can attach a rubber band around these to give a little tension to the system and turn the screw eyes this way so you can look down and see your how your clock wheel is pointed right through the center of those. And step 10, attach your polar alignment device and align it with the hinge of the tracker. As I said earlier, the drinking straw works okay but for very wide angle lenses like I'm using. I'm gonna be doing 24 millimeters, but to use this at 50 or 70 millimeters, I think I'd need to find a better polar alignment device. And that's it, let's go test it. Okay, it's 3.20 a.m. I'm at a Bortle 4 site. This will be my first Milky Way of the season. I'm really excited. I'm ready to actually try this thing out. And the first step is we need to polar align it. And I'm just gonna try to sight Polaris with this metal drinking straw. Just try to center it in the, the straw. Polaris, of course, is the, the last star in the little handle of the little dipper. Um, and this is just gonna be a good enough polar alignment. Um, not a great polar alignment, but since Polaris is actually about a half a degree off from the pole, um, but hopefully for a wide angle lens like this 24 millimeter, this will work well enough. So here we go. All right, the second step now that we're polar aligned is we have to find our target um, by moving the camera around on the ball head until we're pointing at it. So I wanna be pointing at the Ro Ufiuki area, which is pretty easy to find because there's a bright visible reddish star called Antares, which is right in the middle. And it's part of, again, the easy to spot Scorpius constellation. So here we go, I'm just gonna go find it. The third step now is I'm, I wanna focus on the stars using the live view. I'll just zoom in to 10 times and try to make the stars as small as possible on the screen. The fourth step is I'm gonna put the camera into bulb mode and just connect this simple bulb timer or shutter release um, so I can take two minute long exposures. This has a little lock, so I'll basically just start an exposure, lock it, and then at the end of two minutes, unlock it. So now we're all ready to start tracking. Uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, my first few tests were not successful. I was still getting sort of trailed stars. I found through a lot of trial and error though that with this camera and lens I'm using here, which again are the Rebel T7 or 1500D and the Rokinon 24 millimeter lens at 2.8, that I need to move the clock wheel or the, the bolt at a rate of every 2.5 seconds. Um, and I thought maybe I could get away with every five seconds, but I'm getting trails still. I'm getting much rounder stars by moving it 
15 degrees every two and a half seconds rather than 30 degrees every five seconds. So it's not too bad. It's just a little bit um, tough on my neck to keep looking down at it, um, but I can adjust the tripod height to sort of fix that. I'm just using the stopwatch on my phone to, to watch the seconds go by, and I've just done some short tests so far. Um, but let's go ahead and take a full two minute exposure now that I think I have it working, and we'll see what we get. Wow, will you look at that. I'm amazed at how good this looks. This is just, a, again, a single two minute exposure with this barn door tracker. Let me zoom in on it so you can see what I'm seeing here. Just really good detail. Stars are nice and sharp and round. Um, I think this is gonna be a keeper. I'm gonna try to take as many as I can before sunrise here. Um, so I'm gonna get right back into it. So I've taken 10 two minute exposures. They're all looking good but I'm getting close to the bottom of the bolt. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewind it by turning it clockwise now, this way. Okay, I'm done rewinding it. I'm now gonna to have to re-point the camera on my object because uh, by rewinding it, I probably threw off the pointing a little bit. Um, and then I'll take 10 more two minute exposures. Uh, and probably by then the sun will be rising and I'll have to stop. Um, so we'll have 20 two minute exposures for 40 minutes total. Well, it's the next day. I've gone ahead and processed what I shot last night. And I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed by this barn door tracker. I wasn't so sure if a manual tracker was gonna be able to keep up with a modern DSLR with small pixels. But as long as you rotate the bolt frequently enough to avoid trailing, I found it works really well. That took a little trial and error. Of course, the big advantage of using this tracker over just shooting on a fixed tripod is to get 40 minutes total time on my target like I did last night. I only had to shoot 20 photos at two minutes each. If I was shooting without a tracker to get to 40 minutes, I would have had to do 600 photos at four seconds each. So taking hundreds of photos will wear out your camera's shutter faster and take a lot longer to stack on your computer. Of course, there are some cons to this tracker too. Um, the manual nature of it made it a bit uncomfortable on my neck to be looking down at it for 40 minutes, just slowly moving that wheel. And I suppose some people would also find it pretty boring to just manually track that long. So keep those things in mind. What's next for this project? Well, I wanna buy a used finder device, like I mentioned, with maybe a crosshair eyepiece so I can better polar align. And that will allow me to try longer focal lengths because I've only really tried it seriously at 24 millimeters. I did try um, a little bit longer focal lengths, but um, I wasn't getting good results. I think it was because of polar alignment error. So once I've done like a version two of this, I also wanna test it against some of the cheaper commercial options um, like this Omegon um, LX2 uh, wind-up tracker and the Move Shoot Move, which is a little bit motorized tracker, but it's very small. Um, and so you can look forward to a part two eventually where I will show you my improvements and try it against uh, these options, uh, you know, $30 tracker versus a little bit more expensive ones. Well, the only thing left now is the image reveal. So let's start with the single unprocessed two minute exposure. Here it is, cropped in a bit to fill the screen. And uh, we can zoom in on some stars here just to show you that they are indeed round. Okay, and here is after. And all I did in the processing was really, uh, you know, stack uh, with, I think I did 12 darks. I didn't have time to do flats or bias, so it was just uh, 20, 20 lights and 12 darks 
matched uh, temperature darks. And I, I just stacked those in Deep Sky Stacker, brought this into Photoshop and did my usual sort of playing around with curves and saturation and stuff. I also just want to mention here again at the end that I have a Patreon and um, another perk of my Patreon is I now have an exclusive video just for people who support me on Patreon. And that the topic of that video is uh, choosing different types of deep sky objects and what kind of gear, filters, and sky conditions you might need for different types. Like if you want to shoot a star cluster, do you need a filter? Do you need a dark sky? That kind of thing. Um, if you want to shoot a constellation, what's the best focal length for that? So I, I go through some different types of deep sky objects. So if you're interested, check out uh, my Patreon. It starts at just $1 a month. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. Clear skies.